welcome. Welcome, everyone. Is it okay? Welcome, everyone, to the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia series. My name is Bess Vincent, and as the curator for the series, it's my honor to welcome you all here today. This semester, our lineup explores the theme of culture, diffusion, and power. Each speaker will discuss elements of cross-cultural or temporal experiences, the intermingling of ideas and the consequences, both good and bad, for doing so. If you haven't already done so, you can find more information about this semester's speakers by grabbing one of the bookmarks out front, by visiting the website, and by joining our mailing list. We also have these evaluation surveys that hopefully you picked up on your way in, and we hope we encourage you to fill those out and drop them off on your way out. We also thank you for being flexible with today's setup with the mobile market outside. Uh, we will probably see some traffic coming in through the exterior door here soon, so thank you for being flexible on that. Before we begin, I have a few practical notes. If you're a student and you need a certificate of attendance for being here today, they'll be available at the back exit after the talk. For faculty and staff who may be attending and wish to receive multicultural diversity training credit, if you haven't already done so, you'll be able to sign in at that back table after the talk as well. We ask that you silence your cell phones and turn off your screens to avoid distractions to others. There'll be an opportunity for questions and answers following the presentation. So, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer after the presentation, and there are two microphones placed in the aisles. At the designated time, we'll invite you, those of you who wish to uh, ask questions, to make your way to one of those microphones. This is especially important for those who may be watching on Facebook Live or who may watch it later so they can hear the questions asked. So we ask that you plan accordingly. While we try to have copies of the books available for the presentation, our speaker's book, Field Notes on Ordinary Love, has not been released yet. So we hope that you'll consider pre-ordering a copy uh, once so that you have it on release on May 21st. Now I'd like to invite Kamani Brown up to the stage to deliver an introduction for today's distinguished speaker. Today, we are very fortunate to have Keith Wilson here with us, who will deliver a presentation titled, Field Notes, Race, Love, and Violence in the Melting Pot. Through the fields of Kentucky and the cityscape of Chicago, Wilson's poetry collection Field Notes on Ordinary Love presents a unique perspective on love, race, and everyday life in the United States. Wilson will read from his collection and discuss how culture and race shape experiences. Keith S. Wilson is a game designer, an Appalachian poet, a Cave Conum Fellow, and a graduate of the Hallelu Creative Writing Workshop. He has received three scholarships from Breadloaf, as well as scholarships from McDowell, Ucross, Malay Colony, and the Vermont Studio Center, among others. Keith serves as assistant poetry editor at Four Way Review and digital media editor, editor at Obsidian Journal. His first book, Deal Notes on Ordinary Love, will be published by Copper Canyon in 2019. His work has appeared or is appearing in the following journals, Poetry, Adroit Journal, Crab Orchard Review, Little A, Narrative, 32 Poems, Rhino, Muzzle, Blue Shift Journal, and Vinyl. Additionally, he won a Best of the Net Award. Additionally, he won a Best of the Net Award, has been anthologized in the Best New Poets, and was appointed a Gregory Janikian Scholar. His nonfiction won a Redivider Blurred Genre Prize. Prior to this symposia, I had the pleasure of reading two of Mr. Wilson's works, one titled Tinder, and the other titled Asterism. After gaining a mere preview into the mind of Mr. Wilson, I must truly and honestly say we are in for a delightful surprise today. I urge us all to prepare to be thought provoked by opening our hearts, minds, and ears. Don't merely understand, but feel. 
Don't merely think, but analyze. Don't merely hear, but listen. With that being said, I would like my fellow peers, faculty, and other staff members of the Montgomery College community to join me in warmly welcoming Mr. Keith Wilson here. Thank you all. I think, yeah, everyone can hear me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be doing some reading today of uh, poetry, as, as was said. Um, part of it, the first half of this, um, I'm going to be reading from my collection, Field Notes on Ordinary Love. Uh, so that comes out 521 of this year um, through Copper Canyon Press. So yeah, uh, please look for it on Amazon or Barnes and & Noble, and you'll be able to pre-order it there. Um, the other half, I'm going to be reading poems that weren't really designed to be read out loud. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. I'm going to, I'm going to explain more of that in a second. Um, but until I get to those poems, I'm just going to sort of leave this up here. You'll, you'll get to look at my name for a long time. Um, I want to thank uh, Bess Vincent. I want to thank Katima Lee. Uh, both of them are a lot of the reason that I'm here, and they um, helped me get here. I drove here yesterday from Kenyon College. It was a uh, seven-hour drive, um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm rested up and ready to do this reading. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, with one of the kinds of poems that are sort of in my book. So. The collection is called Fieldness and Ordinary Love. About half of these poems are sort of about um, race and racial violence, um, especially in Kentucky, which is where I spent about half my life after I moved from California when I was 12. Um, and this is a poem from sort of that group of, of, uh, of poems. And so this, this poem is sort of written, I began to, 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 to kind of take notes on blackness. Uh, my dad is black, my mom is white, and so it's something that I sort of have thought about for a long time. Uh, I grew up in an area that has ha had uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of history, um, both historically, so it's like the, the very end of the Underground Railroad is where um, I grew up, but also in terms of, of my experience there. So I don't often get recognized as black, um, and my experience in Kentucky has been one in which people thought that I was Mexican or Middle Eastern, and I experienced uh, a, a lot of uh, racism surrounding that um, in the fields uh, that sort of exist around where I live. So this is a poem where I, I, I sort of tried to grapple with all of that, about what it means to be black in America, um, and sort of the landscape of Kentucky. So this is called Field Notes. One, in physics, dark matter isn't made of anything. It's a free citizen that passes unburdened through the field, through itself, through you. Two, it helps to observe from a distance, the field, for instance, as a statement the South has chosen to make, the way whiteness, too, is often rhetorical. As when an older student remarks, in those beginning days that only he observed MLK's holiday, while his black friends working did not. Three, sometimes love is a black dot in a field. Sometimes, suddenly, it is not. Four, or how can black be the absence of all color? Take this cruiser. See the light strike blue off the car like copper through a fountain. Five, there is a difference between what is fair and what is just. For instance, it is fair that I try to love your skin even when it is not touching my own. Six, whiteness is an alibi. The way the officer was like a steam engine only I could see. Seven, inside where nothing shows, I am of course not black, but that does not matter to the field. Eight, some colors are indistinguishable at night. Put your hands behind your back, a different cop once asked me. It was so sincere, 
he was so polite. Nine, as a boy, you learn to know the inside without being required to feel it. As when, now, I understand a bucket or a hood. 10. He asks my girlfriend not if she is white, since even in this light, what we are is obvious. But instead, he speaks philosophically. Ma'am, he asks, are you here of your free will? 11. Sometimes whiteness is a form itself of hyperbole. Try this. Sit in a field. Then try reading Andrew Jackson's quotes on liberty. Only pretend they are being written by his slaves. 12. Look at the word black on the paper, and you will see a definite black, a kind, a certainty. Or if you see nothing at all, that, of course, is a kind of black, too. 13. By the road, my father showed me cotton once. Look at that, he said. So about half the, <laughs> thank you. Um, about half the collection is sort of about, uh, about growing up in Kentucky, about my family, about racism, about gender. Um, and the other half sort of is about love, but in particular about um, a specific kind of love that I was trying to sort of focus on, um, which is basically that, that when, we, when we think about love, when we read love poetry or when it's sort of taught or shown to us um, in cinema or in books, we often sort of think about it as, like first of all, as being entirely uh, romantic, um, romantic or sexual love. Um, but secondly, that it's, it's often like highly dramatic. So love is like your family forbidding you from being with someone and you having to hide and someone taking poison um like that's sort of what love is um but in in real life love is much more expansive than that and it includes uh familial love it includes platonic love like love between friends um and it's also much more about everyday experience it, it, when you think back of um, at many of the experiences that make up uh, your relationship with someone that you really care deeply about, most of those experiences end up being you like sitting on the couch together or driving somewhere or eating dinner together. They're not dramatic, um, you know, there's no explosions happening or anything. Um, and so I, I, a lot of these poems are sort of written around that, around um, remembering someone that I loved, um, but in particular, like these these very ordinary experiences. So this one is about um, just waking up every day next to them. So this is called Obad to Collapsed Star. You bankrupt the sun, underwater statue, dark galaxy of faults, our bed a garden of the littlest size of our waking, our room abstract, our body heat in space, the condensation as the light makes heaven of it, we're early, curved and signatory, the sheets paler than the sky and made immaterial. My hands confused for want of your hands or waste, rolling what claims we make of earth, what is inferred and isn't sure, what the undersides of the leaves of the forest floor are called, your breath, my limbs and yours, all of space cannot be space, arousing patches in the grass, a mouse I never said to you, invasion of clover, black pollen of your hair. Only yesterday I said I love, the opposite of stars, the moon's clear effects on the sea. In sleep, no body is the lead. I am dreaming imaginary numbers of fruit flies, mercury and bird song, and the trash collector, and the water glittering beige on the street of the Milky Way as portrayed by the swirl of your waves. I ought to have married you against the ifs of this world, out of flux, with all the dishes and the dust on the books, and your late mornings, each movement I have missed like this, and I, accustomed to the wall when I awake, the exodus of your laugh, mascara. So this next poem is, um, is about 
my dad, I guess, about my relationship with my dad, but it's also about how complicated uh, masculinity is, um, which uh, I guess a lot of my poetry is sort of about. Um, and so this poem sort of deals with how uh, there are ways in which I have sometimes viewed um, the way that my dad expresses love as, as being one way, um, but that it's sort of important to understand the way that he experienced love from his father, which uh, involved a, a lot of violence, essentially. So this is called The Way I Hold My Hands. I can't imagine my father wishing he would rather be anything. Once upon a time, he was a watermelon growing from a box. His mother died. His father beat the blush out of him and teardrops dripped black from his face into his food. My father's father made him eat his dinner through himself. The miracle whip salad spangled like the garden in dew. This isn't a figure of speech. My father ate his blood. It's hard to think he must have been young. He made me stop all my life. He told me not to be a girl. Whatever I was doing, of course I stopped. He kissed me on the top of the head before I went to bed each night. He was always there. He read to my brother. He read to me from a book of animals. This is a fox's paw. This is a bear's. He told me, I'll give you something to cry about. He never touched me. Bear claw, I said. Winters are easier for bears. I spread my fingers over his. No, my father said. So this next poem is, um, is another, uh, another love poem. And, and you'll notice that, um, especially the love poems, but a lot of the poems from this collection in general use a lot of the language um, of, astro uh, of uh, astrology or uh, astronomy, uh, a little bit of astrology, uh, a lot of like science terms. And so this poem is called Asterism. And so um, what that term refers to is, is there's like a set number of constellations in the sky. I, I, now I can't remember the number. It's something like 100, it's over 100 um, constellations that exist. And those are all already determined and they were all that they are all that will ever exist um, of, the, of constellations. So any other sort of grouping of stars, uh, like the Northern Cross, is called an asterism. Uh, so it's like not an official grouping of stars. It's something that, that people decided after that grouping was decided. Um, so this poem is called Asterism. It's funny to think now of that silence, with you at the desk reading and me writing on the couch separately and the meaning of that nothing happening all around us still, were you able now to hold my hand? Or if you continued to sit sometimes in this chair, tired of the world outside of us? Or if I any more wrote about possibilities other than this? Or the curve of your nose, the bridge beneath my lips? That is, if the silence of the two of us were predicated by my being able now to reach you, how that quiet, that night in this room, might seem a comfort, but instead of that, the candles between and neither of us with anything in particular to say, the quiet trembles because your voice isn't a feather I can hold, but a thought I draw across my throat when I close my eyes. I'm trying to say that though the mass of the absence has already gone, a world revolves around it still. The two of us who try to speak like stars that cannot be heard because of all the things they say is space. This next poem is, um, I don't, so this, this next poem is sort of written from a space where I was kind of looking at Sappho's poetry. And so for, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sappho, her poetry was, was written um, and essentially like largely lost, like the, the, what we have of it are, um, are fragments of manuscripts, essentially, um, that people have sort of put together. So th there are like large portions of each poem that are just missing. Um, but the way that we read them is as if, is as if they are not missing. Um, we sort of receive her poetry um, as if it, she wrote it that way and intended it that way. And so I was trying to write a poem sort of imagining um, that kind of a thing, like to, to write a poem in which there are large portions of it missing. Um, that deals in particular with um, with 
with violence and masculinity in particular against women so this is a poem called scrapbook after the poet levin osman one look in the middle distance the siren screams like a fatherless boy unashamed two sisyphus hikes up her dress she labors pushing always a man and if she shrugs he rolls atop her or the town at the foot of the hill or a man calling himself sisyphus knocks and says push is a man's verb but she can help or else he says quiet three it said we are afraid of what we don't understand who among us is shaken by latin we are terrified of what might overtake us sadness marriage spanish rain four like a sextant he angled himself as if as if to kiss his hands in the ocean of her of her eyes and his knee pressed against the air like a rudder five how can i make you understand as a boy i held a bell in my hand and i grew to be a man who looks back on that bell six what is there to say that was yesterday seven the first thing odysseus decides when he returns is to cock his bow fire in the crowd over and again bullets move at flirtatious angles eight in the city the first november rain laps at a set of heels nine a family of plantains no one speaks their name actually a silence even when they are perfect and brown every domestic familiar unpretty thing 10 i'll say it again if a hand is big enough it doesn't matter what you call it 11 the story of orpheus and the bear is this orpheus of course sings his wife is distinguished by her marriedness to orpheus jumping ahead he left behind his clothing his furniture and everything 12 there is an old story of a man that is the story there is an old story of a woman that the old story of the man spoke over i am his son 13 imagine here the voice of a woman 14 a list of all that is fixed only the ground this next poem is called a short list of grievances first you are invisible which is another word for jesus she's gone second the medulla oblongata makes you automatic so even when i am not thinking of your hips i'm thinking of your hips the dreams i have dreamed of being loosed like a sparrow would pronounce themselves into wilder dreams if i were a bird already i would have to eat nothing until i was thin as the air and i'd baffle the moon my simple machines turning the mobile of the sky i could be ready heave and release only the nothing of a bird third you are right i am cabinetry i'm a man that needs to know conclusively that he is empty your name you know is a midnight call i am talking too much about air and hardly about breath who do you think really makes me lift my chest this should be simple but it never is consider the wing to which the burden of air becomes the burden of flight this next poem uh, it, it, this next one is called God Particle. It's maybe not that much about the God Particle, um, which is like a, a thing in physics. And maybe the more that you understand about the God Particle, the less this makes sense. But um, it's sort of me trying to examine, uh, it began as sort of me trying to examine love at like the most granular level. Um, like looking at it in a very, like the very smallest portions of it. So this is called God Particle. You were the smallest thing. Think of the terrified play of rabbits in the grass before the street. Fractional, they are ants reverse engineering the desperate flapping of the land. 
even less. They are mindless atoms, unaware of themselves or the heart between matter and time. You were smaller and more precious than that. If you imagine them littler than eyelashes, the tissue paper carapace, thorax, all of it, the bones of ships under glass, if you can imagine the elements of those atoms, of those ants and rabbits, as not the skin of the observable universe, but the whisper upon which we build a hearth, you'll understand. Call it want or dependence or sleep. Call it eventide or home. How to summarize a galaxy with a night. We are impossible to, bit, to fix. Dust motes and a million paths of light. I know. Eventually it all comes down to an admission. Whatever my failings, didn't I come to it eventually? So this next poem, make sure that that can come back up. Um, my next poem is um, about terraforming. So the idea that sort of you can go to another planet and make it um, Earth-like. You can make it habitable. Um, and also really plays with the word like, um, both as like sort of a simile, but also the way that you sort of talk about love when you're very young. Um, is you don't say that you, you love someone, you, you like them. Um, so this is a poem about that. I investigate terraforming in my 30s. Soon enough, I find an Earth-like planet. But how Earth-like is only like, is like how a kiss may be alike, but isn't quite. Or how every photo from Kentucky, how you used to sigh, is only now a likeness. Or how this bandaged light upends the bruise that became the sky. I liked you. I like liked you. And we held each other as we made our childhoods hush. We strained to merge like trees into a custom. We held to each other's hands even when our notes were misaligned. We would, without half trying, alight one upon the other. What is gravity to our horns? We reached and tore each other plain as walls or erstwhile countries. And the dream became a sun beneath me, the land, the fate of wing, my every instrument a lyre's vital music, my every simile a flame. So I'm gonna read just a couple more from this collection, then I'll move on to some of the newer things. Um, so this first poem is basically about how I like really love pigeons. They're like one of my favorite things in the entire world. Um, so when I moved to, to Chicago from Kentucky, I had like a walk that I, I would do basically every day um, to and from work. I worked at a grocery store uh, for a long time. And uh, I would have to walk under these bridges um, that supported the, the, the metro. And there were just tons of pigeons in there, and I, I wanted to write a poem about them because I find, find them beautiful. Um, but also, one of the things I find interesting about pigeons is they're, is they're essentially the same bird as doves. Um, so another term for a pigeon is a rock dove. And I just found it like very interesting the way that we sort of handle those two different kinds of birds, that one of them is, is colorful, and that's the pest, and the one that's pure white is the one that we release at weddings. Um, so this is a poem I, I wrote called, I Find Myself Defending Pigeons. I love how you never find their bodies, how they never rest their eyes. I love how their breasts are comforters unfolding by their breath. I love that pigeons live in the city, that underestimation never stopped a pigeon from unlatching itself or being old. I want them all unspooling in the air, and bridges that are half sigh and half pigeon. I want to harbor their coup and utilize it for energy. I want to learn to use them the way they want to be used. I want to pigeon tail into a quiet night, to let their oddness sit in our hands. You can never know a language until you quiet your own. I want people to write about them. They're leaving ships for land or standing on their own on a marble statue in the shimmer of a field. I want to talk about the term rock dove, argue over whether or not it's imperialist. 
I want the media to implicate us in the pigeon problem. For a couple to sit with their asparagus and kids and realize none of this is far from them, whatever we think. I want oils and watercolors and inks. I want still life with pigeons, since not a one has ever been portrayed with soul. A flight of them around old bread. And how they're all the same. How all the world is here with them in hate, since they are rats adorned with angel wings. And the children down the street are free to chase their drag. They want to see a pigeon's rouge entirely. Let the pigeon have her pigment. Consider the pigeon's brown and green and everything, the brandishing of his nakedness to the sun as if nothing is absolute. I love the pigeon's shoulders, tongues, and wedding nights. I love the pigeon's place in history, their obsession with living in the letters of our signs. I love their minds, or what I've come to believe is their theology. Who knows? Let the pigeon speak. Ask the closest pigeon for his number for her middle name, if they are ready to die, if the sky gets crowded enough to consider war, if their stores are closed on Sundays. I want to be ready for them to be just like us, but more ready for them to be completely different. I don't want to waste any time tracing a pigeon's God to Abraham. I want to get started. Some of us feed pigeons. I love sometimes our care. I love, I think, the park bench. I love apples, but I do not love pears. The weather. I love the pigeons, the revolution of wheel to sky. I love the newspaper graying in a different air. This next poem is called Black Matters. It's after a poem by D.H. Lawrence. Um, it's sort of, I don't entirely know how to describe it. It's sort of like uh, metrically fits that, the poem that he wrote. His, the poem that he wrote, I, I believe, is called Shades. Um, and so these lines sort of um, rhythmically feel like the things that he says in that poem, but it's about, uh, this poem is about sort of police violence. Um, so this is called Black Matters. Shall I tell you then that we exist? There came a light, blue and white careening. The police like wailing angels to bitter me. And so this. Dark matter is hypothetical. I know that it cannot be seen in the gunpowder of a flower, in a worm that raisins on the concrete, in a man that wills himself not to speak. Gags, oh gags, for a shadow cannot breathe. It deprives them of nothing. Pride is born in the black and dies in it. I hear our shadow, low treble of the clasping of our hands. Dark matter is invisible, we infer it, how light bends around a black body. And still, you do not see black halos, even here, my having told you plainly where they are. This last poem is, um, is a love poem. It's, uh, it's also another one of the poems that sort of heavily uses um, the language of of space and astronauts. Uh, it has an epigraph. Um, so the poem is called Heliocentric, and the epigraph is from, um, from the Odyssey. It is, if I beg and pray you to set me free, then bind me more, more tightly still. Uh, so this is what Odysseus said um, when they were getting close to the sirens. I'm striving to be a better astronaut, but consider where I'm coming from the exosphere, a desk where the bluest air thins to a lip. Impossible to know the difference between, or the difference from where I sit in space. I promise I still dream of coming back to you, settling on your yellow for the kitchen. And we won't fight, not in this manifest, not over the crumpled bodies of laundry. We won't row, we won't row over the nail polish, its color, the spilled sun. Inspiration is the deadliest radiation. It never completely leaves the bones. You know. From here, there are no obstructions but the radiant nothingness. An aurora borealis opens like a fish. This, to the pyramids, yes, to a great wall. And there you are, 
moving from curtain to curtain. Oh, to fantasize of having chosen some design with you. But the moons over Jupiter, the asteroids like gods deadened by the weight of waiting. I remember you said pastel for the cabinet where the spice rack lives, that I ought to have picked you up flowers when I had a chance. Daisy, iris, sun, red roses, ultraviolet, the color of love. What else but this startles the air open like an egg? I'm really trying to be better, to commit to memory the old songs about the ground, to better sense your, lat your latitude, see the corona of your face, take your light as it arrives. Earth is heavenly too, but know that time is precious here, how wine waits years and years to peak. What is there to do? I've made love to satellites in your name. I'm saying I don't know when I'll return. Remember me, for here are dragons and the primitive song of sirens. Stars that sway Elysian, ships that will not moor, lovers who are filled with blood and nothing further. Who could love you like this? Who else will sow you in the stars? Who better knows your gravity and goes otherwise to catastrophe? I've schemed and promised to bring you back a ring from Saturn. But a week passes, or doesn't manage. Everything steers impossible against the boundless curb of light. Believe I tried for you. Against space, time takes almost everything away. To you, for you, a toast to everything incredible. I almost wish I'd never seen the sky when always there was you. Sincerely. So I'm going to move on from there to some of the newer poems. Um, it's kind of wild to think about, but whenever you receive a book, even a, a book that's so new that it's not quite out yet, that book has been worked on for many years, and it's been maybe a year or many years uh, since it was totally done that the author has like, worked on it and uh, the publisher has gone through and proofed it. And so even though this book's not out yet, they're, they're still like older poems to me. And so I've been working on a lot of poetry since then. Um, and I, I mentioned th these poems that I'm about to read, um, saying that they're like, not entirely intended to be read out loud. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that written language is, is sort of designed to to, to mimic the way that we speak. So it's supposed to allow for the things that we would otherwise be able to say to exist on a page minus our like body language and the way that we inflect our voices and so on. But it ends up becoming like its own separate thing when it's a, when it's a visual object. Um, basically like the easiest way to explain this is that there are things that you can say like via text message that you can't say in real life um, so like anytime that you use an emoji, that's a thing that is like not translatable out loud, right? Um, and so these are not poems that necessarily use emoji, but they do use like visual elements that I don't know how to read out loud, um, or I don't know what order to read something in, um, and that's part of the point. So I'm gonna have them projected up on the screen for you guys to sort of follow along, um, and we'll see how this, how this goes. This first poem is actually from uh, my book, but it's an example of uh, an earlier poem where I was sort of playing with this. So this is a poem that I stripped away all of the punctuation from it, um, which allows you to, on the page, see that certain lines can be read multiple ways. Um, and the moment that I read them out loud, I've chosen one of those ways. So hopefully you can sort of hear it still, and you, or you'll be able to see it on the screen. Um, but this is a poem called Tercets, and what a tercet is is a group of three um, it's a stanza of three lines of poetry, and you'll notice that it is a poem that is not actually written in, in tercets. Um, but here it is, and I will read it. Um, tercets. Love, it's only gotten worse. My father can't stop saying your name like a war his nation lost, or a miracle that saved him from an undertow unprompted. You rise like a body from a lake. Before dinner, grace has never been more biblical. And in the gasp about your name, the quiet 
being the inverse of a heartbeat I depended on, a season for which there is no dress, and I say, yeah, and I say, yeah, Dad. But you, love, are a tragedy in my father's eyes, my reflection. Having just shaved, my skin is tender, I say, before he can say, I remember, yes, she was just like that. I cannot change that. I remember my love. I swallow my hands every day, taking the place of your hands on the table. That's a poem. It's an older poem, but it's a poem I don't generally read out loud because there are parts of it that, um, that, are like, that feel to me untranslatable. Um, but we're going to sort of ease into the next kind of, of poem, which are, is a poem that uses um, some sort of visual element. So this is a very basic one, um, or at least a very short one. So this, this next poem is just one line long. Um, and hopefully, you can sort of see um, how it interacts with the image that it appears with. So this is called Transcendental Function. I need to let you go. So that's the entire poem. Um, and I won't generally sort of explain these, in part because I'm not a visual artist, and so I'm sort of interested in, in hearing what other people think and experimenting and figuring out what I think. Um, but in this case, I'll just sort of mention that one of the things that I, I sort of think is interesting about like the sine wave, which is what this is for, for you like math people, um, uh, is, is that it's sort of infinite. It goes on forever and ever, and it's like the ri rising and lowering. Um, and so it feels like it represents something when coupled with this line. Um, this next poem is based on two very different subjects. One of them is uh, Emmett Till, who, uh, who you know, famously was lynched when he was 14 years old um, in Mississippi, August 28th, 1955. Um, and the other sort of portion of this poem is uh, the idea of the uncanny valley. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, it's sort of a term that kind of arose from robotics, uh, or at least it's heavily associated with robotics. And it's the idea that like the closer that you get to when you're very far away from portraying a human's appearance, people are fine with it. So like cartoons are, are often like that. It's like clearly not a real human being. Dolls are like that. Um, and people are like fine with that. And if you get so good at portraying a human being that people can't notice, then they're also fine with it because then you just don't know that it's not a human. So like really, really good CGI is like that, um, where if in a movie you can't tell that they've sort of like added a character into a scene, then you're fine with it. But there's like a, a thing called the uncanny valley that when you are very close to being to appearing human, but not quite, uh, it makes people very uncomfortable. So bad CGI is like this, where someone looks sort of photorealistic, but their facial expressions don't quite work uh, the way that we are used to them working. And that it like creeps people out and, and it bothers people. And so the uncanny valley in robotics is like a, a, a portion of human appearance that they're trying to like get around. either. You go one way where, you, where you, you make a robot obviously a robot, or you make them so realistic that they appear human. So that's like a long explanation of what that, that term is. Um, but here's the poem. It's called Uncanny Emmett Till. So the legend reads, boy, a world. Only in retrospect is an animal worth recognizing. Something surely filled the time before the gunshot. A wolf whistle. Here lies the bullet. Call him Ishmael, laying like a nail in the esophagus of the Tallahatchie River. The body. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. God is good all the time. Let the people see what they did to my boy. This next poem uh, is another kind of poem that I've been experimenting with, which is uh, two things combined. One of them is I, I'm interested in leaving poems unpunctuated, so then they allow for like a bunch of ambiguous readings. Um, so that's the first part. And the second part is sort of mapping stuff onto it, like diagramming it, so that there's other poems within a poem, which will make more sense in a second. 
Um, but this, this next poem is called Apotheosis, which means the sort of raised to the state of God. Um, and what sort of inspired this poem is sort of the, the way that we have historically treated the black body is that the public at large has always been way more comfortable with treating black people as human beings when they're athletes or musicians or entertainers. Um, and way less comfortable doing that when they're like, like human beings, when they're regular people who they meet um, face to face, or when they do something that isn't at like the highest peak of performance um, on a stage. So anyways, this is a poem called Apotheosis. The quiet builds like snow in a footprint. You rise, but when you rise, you brought down seasons that don't promote the right food or dress. Let the earth stick you brown and the sky stone you black and read your bones white. See what good it does to let them touch the face of God. And so I'll just read um, a couple of the other like possible readings of this. Um, but you can sort of see that I've written like diagrams around it. So to sort of possibly guide a person to read it. Um, but there's sort of like another poem within this poem, if you like sort of follow those lines, which is touch down but don't rise. Dress white, rise black brown. Face the earth and the sky like a stone. Um, this next poem is about how when we try to, to, to like make a change, uh, we often sort of try to appeal to, especially to men, to, to be good men, essentially. And so this is a, a poem sort of interrogating what that means, like what it means to be a good man, um, especially in like a national dialogue. So good men. A good man stands in an earthquake. A good man never speaks. A good man stands in a wildly swinging spotlight and he is determined to drill himself like the titanium rod beneath a tooth. Nobody speaks to the good man, so he doesn't know, and they don't know, and everyone dies of their own accord. The way clouds speed around in transitions of television shows you know, the fast forward films where crowds are zipping around, but a good man is like a building in Times Square. A good man watches the sunset and sits in the dark. He is being watched. A good man speaks. This next poem is um, based on the sort of, I guess the, the premise is, is footnotes that sort of appear in academic writing um, as like a form of poetry. So, uh, and I guess more specifically in, in terms of what it's sort of personal say, personally saying, um, I was sort of considering uh, the way that, that, for me at least, growing up in Kentucky, in, 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 in the South, um, it sort of colors the way that, that black men dying, even of natural causes, feels to me. So my, my dad, um, his brother passed away in Kentucky, and my dad poured the ashes into, um, into our yard. And I guess ashes, the, the like chemical composition of ashes ends up being such that they, they sort of kill the land. And so he tried to plant a tree over it and uh, over the ashes of my uncle and that tree died. Um, and it, it just, it felt like symbolic in some ways. Uh, but, but he, I mean, this is not part of the poem, but he, he planted another tree on top of that. And that tree, which he calls Steve, is still alive today. Um, so anyways, this is called, Who is There to Eulogize the Tree? And they're a little, they're a little hard to see on the um, projection, but there are number, there's one through four um, on that upper portion. So uh, I'll read that portion. The Mason Dixon, you. One. Sorry. A shadow extended long enough becomes just the light. Two, you've never been tender. Moth wings, tobacco strung up to dry the color of a man. You can't walk to the car without stopping for your father to water the yard. He stares across it, bending over, 
thin as a country that lost half itself the Civil War, a cancer sign, the other half to ashes. He plucks every weed as if they were children, could be woven to a throne. You leave them be. Whatever he believes, he believes. Your whole theory of the sky would change if you crossed south of the equator. There, the North Star evaporates, like the killing games children play. Who would you murder first if it meant meandering the stars close to home, keeping them from change? You can try again against impossibility and put hands to head to roots and stand, but every little sun is diamond set into the back of your father's father's land. All that blood played across the innocence, some boat ignorance of trees. They say yours are your father's eyes. He says, look at Steve, who is army green and bends to the wind like a galaxy. Every night, sleeping beside him in the ward, your father never knew your name. Your dream is to be terrible, a monster or a worm, and ratchet back history, and only afterward be good. You are American. You could have told him anything, but of course you never did. Your name unfurls from his name like onion skin. You've never seen your father cry. Once, when his brother died, you think you see it. He waters the snow from where he poured the urn. Your father's brother is a tree, or it's a trick of the light, maybe fireworks. Three, a crow's memory is generational. Four, a wilted kite. This next one is similar to that um, earlier poem that I read. This one's called Run On. Um, Blood is difficult to lift from cotton, from a photo. I learn the names of my extended family after the fact of their being. And so there's like a bunch of different ways to read this. Um, I will just read a few of them. So my blood is difficult. I extend from a photo to lift the names from cotton, the fact of their being. And then all the things that are sort of not highlighted uh, if you read those, it just says, learn a family after, so, sort of a, a ghost passage. So this is, I have just two more poems left. This next one is very, very short. Um, and then I guess there will be some uh, questions and answers maybe. Um, but this next poem is another sort of run-on poem, a poem where um, many of the lines can be read differently depending on where you start reading the line at the beginning of the sentence. Um, or where you decide to end it as the end of the sentence. Um, and in particular, this is about an experience I've, I've had more times than I can count, which is going into a store and being watched. Um, sometimes when I'm trying to give the person the benefit of the doubt, maybe they're, they're just casually, just I'm the only person in the store and maybe they just happen to be watching me. Um, but also many times where someone sends someone to follow me down the aisles, which happens for whatever reason a lot at Best Buy. Um, shout out to Best Buy. So this is a poem called Cell. The store strains with fake light of my life. I say nothing at first. I walk like this is how I walk, being watched, but just being myself lightly. I answer the phone, my love. Hello, sir. Let me be a lone prayer set uh, so our faces abstract in the black glass, our throats almost touch. So this next poem, uh, the poem that I'll sort of end with is about a, a, like a core part of uh, the idea of what America is, which is um, the idea of the melting pot, which is I think I've thought about since I was very young, actually. I remember them talking about it all the time for, for whatever reason. I, when I was living in California, when I was in um, elementary school, I remember a teacher talking about the melting pot all the time, that America is a melting pot. Um, and the thing that I think is sort of interesting about that is that when we talk about America being a melting pot, what we're actually, what people usually mean by that is that you add a bunch of different ingredients and you get like, like blended soup. Like they mean something akin to like assimilation that everybody comes from all over the world to America and then they become American and, and they're no longer that other thing that, that they once were. Um, but like 
that idea is both problematic and not even true of like how like soup works. Um, but like if you add like a bunch of carrots to like gumbo, you can still see the carrots at the end. Um, they like still exist in the soup um, and they are still carrots. They're just also now gumbo as well. Um, and so this is a poem sort of written about um, about who I who like who I think I am, who I am, um, but also sort of trying to break down the different parts of that, um, which by its like itself is a difficult and maybe um, wrong handed wrong headed uh, enterprise. But I, I still gave it a shot. So this is called Melting Pot. Mom made three dinners and ate hers last. Once, I snapped at her, and she started to cry, and my silence felt powerful in a way that made me want to cry myself, as if the language I had been taught was not designed for this. I did say I was sorry, but I couldn't figure for what. My father used to play dominoes online, and if you're wondering at his skill, I will tell you dad is black and getting older. When people saw his score, they quit. Okay. Yeah, so one side line, I'll just like, explain part of this because I just find it like the most interesting story. I, I, like, I, I was torn whether I wanted to like, write a whole essay on this or not. Um, but my dad used to play dominoes online. And the way that it sort of worked is that like, it created this leaderboard that shows who's like, doing well in, in, in dominoes. And my dad, was, his score was so much higher than everyone else playing that game. That, that when people noticed that they were playing against him, they just immediately quit, because they'd know, like, there's just no way I can beat you. Um, and so what my dad had to do was create another username and start over from the beginning, so that he was like a new person who had like a low score so that people would play him again. And he did this so many times that he started running out of names, like real people's names. So he had to start using like made up words, or not made up words, but just words. So he would, you know, call himself like Pepper or desk or, or whatever. Um, and the thing that's super interesting about this to me is that people, when he beat them, he would destroy them. Like he would just, like, they didn't know he was way better than them, but he was. And so occasionally people would just like call him a name. But when the name that he chose was a name that they thought was a woman's name, so like it was, if it was a flower, then they would call him a bitch. They would like they would real. They would always say something negative, and it would always be related to him being a woman, which of course he like he wasn't. But uh, they just assumed that he was. So, anyways, I'll start over that section because it refers to that. My father used to play dominoes online, and if you're wondering at his skill, I will tell you, Dad is black and getting older. When people saw his score, they quit. Dad had to change his name dozens of times as he became a celebrity in the leaderboards. The story of America is a black body reinventing itself until it runs out of names. My father's father was a cop. Brain cancer took him. That's the story of justice in America. Dominoes is not even a game of chance, but their faces are black and white and made of dice just like me and mine. Did you know I'm a junior? That upsets you. One way your father is bad, missing. I got the other one where I will never be right. Eventually, Dad's name always betrayed him. He ran out of real names, chose random words. He ran out, of, he ran out lives as quickly as bones. When you share in a name, you eat from the same ruinous bowl, like American. Some words sound like girl names to strangers. My father, totally silent as he played, was left to be a secret bastard winning every game until he was a sweet flavor or a tree. Then my father was a bitch. Water is the instrument from which our blood makes treble. What started as a place to play, a field of apples, became a calculus, a million pickers, a composition of black notes. And so too is the night when all we held were hands. Thank you guys. I guess I'll, I'll answer questions, but thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, we'll ask you to make your way to the podium. And I'll say, if you have to leave for another class, we are going to ask that you exit through the exterior door on this side so as not to disturb the mobile market. So if you'd like to ask a question, please come forward. If 
not that it's okay to you. So I noticed across all of your poetry, it's pretty pragmatic as opposed to the normal, like, dramatized poetry that we read. What kind of influenced that? Like, why are you, why is your poetry so pragmatic? <laughs> That's a good question. I think, um, I think when I first began writing poetry, I wrote it sort of uh, from, almost from like a place of philosophy. <laughs> like, I was often thinking about really big ideas. I never wrote about myself. I never wrote about my family. I never wrote about things like love. Um, and so I was like just very taken by when I read a book, by the ideas that that book expressed. And when I read, when I read philosophy, I just loved like having new ideas um, sort of to be introduced to. And so I, I end up writing sort of rhetorically to this day. I write poems that are now much more about myself, but also I don't just write them to sort of express my feelings, although I think that's like a, a great reason to write poetry and to read poetry. Um, but that's like only half of what I'm doing when I'm writing my poems. Um, and so I, I, I don't know whether or not this is necessarily true that like um, removing your, like, like taking a step back and sort of being as you described it a little pragmatic makes something um, m like feel more rhetorical, like, like that, that, that you're making more of a point as opposed to um, as, as, as opposed to whatever the other, whatever the, the opposite of that is, I guess. Um, but I think that's, that's part of the reason that I began sort of writing that way is I felt like I was, like the best way to express an idea was to, to not so fully invest myself in it that it felt like I was just sort of um, spouting uh, the emotions that I had at the time, which I think I'm also still sort of doing, but um, yeah, that was one of the ways I, I tried to approach that. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about why you wanted to incorporate the sciences like physics and astronomy into your poetry. Oh, yeah. So why did I include like all the science talk in, in my poetry? Um, I think the simplest answer to that, like from the very beginning, is just that I'm like just a nerd and I find it interesting and I, I, end, up, I, I end up just writing about the things that are on my mind. So if I read something about um, about space, which I'm often doing, I'm like inclined to want to then include that in my poetry. Um, but that's like a reason to include it on the first draft of a poem and not a reason to keep it in a poem. So the reason that I keep that stuff in my poetry as like not just a thing that came off the top of my head, but like a reason that I think it adds to a poem is partially in terms of the astronomy in particular. I think that there's something really interesting and fascinating something fascinating about how space feels both highly romantic in some ways, like there's just many movies and shows about, um, about the idea that brave people um, are doing everything they can to sort of explore this one of the few places that, that, that exists that we just don't know that much about, um, that there's something sort of both romantic about that and just like totally unknowable and scary. So there's as many like, Star Treks as there are, where, where like this is us being like the, the peak of humanity and being awesome and conquering science. There are like an equal number of like Event Horizon movies that are like, isn't space terrifying or alien movies um, where, where like the fact that we don't know anything about it or very much about it is, is just like scary. And I think that's like in some ways like a, a really great metaphor for what love is. It's like both those things, like both highly romantic and totally unknowable and terrifying um, and like unconquerable because like Star Trek is like one it like feels like like part of the point of that might be that we've conquered space but it, but like we never can it's just like an impossible thing to, to think about um, and in fact like star, that, that show I guess couldn't even really exist if, if they like totally did conquer it or whatever um, it's like just not a thing that we can overcome thank you I'm just Hi. curious about the um, picture on the cover of your book. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so 
I chose, so at the time that this book um, was chosen for publication, I lived in Chicago. Um, actually, I think I have some notes on this. Yeah, here we are. So it's by an artist named Kelly uh, Rom Romani, and she was an artist that was having an open house, essentially, in the neighborhood that I lived in in, um, in Chicago. Um, and I just went into, I was just looking at a bunch of different studios, and I saw her studio had a bunch of these paintings, uh, and you should check out her website, it's just her name, um, K-E-L-L-I-E-R-O-M-A-N-Y.com. Um, but she had like a whole series of these. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from, from like a photograph of them, but they're sort of um, different shades of beige and brown paint poured onto canvases and allowed to drip or separate or, um, and, and, or dry in really, like, really thick um, patterns, I guess. Um, and and the, what she's doing, like the thing that she's referencing is this German uh, scientist who uh, or pseudoscientist who was trying to essentially map all the different skin colors so that he could classify different people's races by their skin color. Um, because like an important aspect of maintaining a system of racism is being able to identify people as the race that you want to like, to create a cast out of, right? Like if you can't prove that a person is black, then you can't treat them the way that you're supposed to treat black people in a racist society, right? Um, and so she's like, this is, she's doing these paintings um, like in response to that, sort of shit, like using the paint to simulate a bunch of different skin tones. And especially when you see them in real life, they, like up close you can see that they're cracked um, because of the way that they dry and it, it feels like a really close up photo of people's skin. Um, I just found them like beautiful and interesting and, um, and like related to many of the things that I'm writing about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, what inspired you to write poems such as Run On with different possible wording choices and different organizations for those choices? <laughs> you know what, the, the answer to a lot of these questions, like from the, like if, if I went all the way far back to the very beginning, is that I didn't have like a good reason for it essentially, that like um, in this case the reason, like the thing that sort of started writing these kinds of poems is, um, I. I is that when I first started writing, I wrote by hand, and I was writing so much that it, it took a really long time to write and then transcribe. So I was like, I can't write by hand anymore. I have to j just use the computer. And I was typing so fast, n like not all the things I was writing were worth saving, but I was writing so fast that um, I was trying to save time, basically, and just like not worry about if I was spelling things wrong or whether or not I was capitalizing things. And over time, I got so used to writing that way that I like began to just like approach the thing that I wrote as that being a purposeful decision that I made. And noticing that like sometimes because I didn't use any punctuation, a line meant more than one thing that I hadn't intended. And I would just like lean into that. I'd be like, that's really cool. I'm gonna make this poem be about that line. <laughs> like I'm gonna keep doing that over and over again. So now it is a purposeful thing that I do where I'm like, perp like from the beginning, I'll often be like, how can I make a poem that's sort of about these different ideas. Um, but in the very beginning, it's like a consequence of like, uh, of, of like being lazy, kind of. Um, it's the answer to that. Hi. Hi. Um, I've read your poem, Black Matters, over and over and over, and was pretty much dreading hearing the rest of your poetry. And it's been really wonderful. And um, thank you for writing it. Uh, I was wondering if you could um, discuss the concept of being Afro-Latin um, in two ways. Um, one, just how you see it, but also in that the society would like to make uh, people with black skin be invisible um, yeah. and uh, not be able to breathe and just then ignore that they can't be able to breathe or something like that. And then the other group that people make invisible are the people in Appalachia. Yeah. The coal miners or something, it's okay to think that they're stupid. And of course, they were totally ignored in the 2016 elections, which of course made it even worse. So I was just wondering about your embracing that term out and um, 
but that concept of invisibility in our society and um, I'm on the faculty, a bunch of my students are here. How do we fight that Invis oh. vis invisibility? Yeah, so there's a few, uh, hopefully I'm gonna, I'll remember to, to answer the different parts of that. So one of them is the term Appalachia, which is, um, it's both like a, an identifier of, of, of groups of people. Um, so it's like a, a portmanteau, a, a combining of the words African and Appalachian. So it's sort of an acknowledgement that black people exist in Appalachia, which largely, um, especially in, in popular media, people just don't even know about. Um, so um, a, a poet named Frank X. Walker, he coined that term and he was my professor in undergrad when I was the age of uh, many of the people in this room. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I started going to school for computer science. I failed calculus three times. Um, I switched to English and I had him as a professor and he was um, teaching poetry and he was highly, highly, like he was, is the reason I'm a poet. Um, and he introduced me to that term and he sort of introduced me to writers living in Kentucky and Appala in Appalachia who were black and, and, who, and who were white, but like a, just like a, a large variety of writers coming from like an area that I, I essentially grew up in. Um, and so yeah, I, I, part of what that term means to do is to, to, um, is to sort of expose something that is made invisible, which is um, the diversity that exists in Appalachia in, in America in general. Part of that has always had to do with race. Part of it has also always had to do with poverty, which is part of the reason that people in Apple, that, that just whatever your race is, um, when you live in Appalachia, um, like people just tend not not to cover uh, in, in the news, they tend not to cover problems that happen in Appalachia. They tend not to cover um, anything that happens there, whether it's good or bad. Um, and then, and then, uh, in the case that like a movie or something is made that takes place in Appalachia, it's always horrible. Um, but I think the, the most famous movie probably about Appalachia is uh, is Deliverance. Um, and so that's like the, the majority of people's like thoughts about what Appalachia is sort of come from that movie, which is like a horror or movie or a thriller um, about just like murderers. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, so that's part of the answer uh, to, to some of the things that you, that you asked about. Also, you asked, um, about like what we can do about that, like what can we do about the fact that that um, that invisible invisibility exists, that there are just like people whose whose voices are being silenced. That's like a really complicated question, right? And I think part of it is that you choose if you have a platform to use it at least in part to mention things that are um, that are not being spoken about. So. Um, so I, I, that's the thing that I'm always trying to do. Um, part of it too, though, that, that I think tends to get spoken about less often, because I think there are, there are a, a large number of people um, who, do, who do mention like, you know, I believe in this thing and so I'm gonna talk about it. So, you know, there are football players doing that like all the time right now, right? Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a crazy idea that like, if you see an injustice that you speak about it. Um, it's not done as often as it ought to be, but there are people talking about that. One thing that's done less often is talking about giving a platform to, like if you have the ability to create a platform, that you have a platform, um, that you ought to, to share it essentially, if you can. And there are many different ways to do that. So you can sort of invite people of color, uh, women, queer writers, you can invite those to, um, to your speaking series if you have one, or to your poetry. Um, your slam poetry thing at your your uh, coffee shop or whatever. Um, other ways that you can do it is sort of to even write about that itself. So like w one way that I tried to sort of do it in um, in one of the poems that I read was I said, imagine here the voice of a woman. So you know that poem when it exists in um, in a in a journal, I can't. For me to even exist in a journal is is in some ways to to, to to have my, my platform, right? Like I can't, it, once I've given it to, if, if I have the ability to give it to someone else, then I just no longer have a platform. Um, and maybe that's the right answer, I have no idea. But 
but then then i've sort of lost my ability to say anything that i think is important and so it's like a it's like a struggle like how do you you can't you can't speak for other people but you also if you if you if you know i don't know i don't know the answer basically so sometimes i try to like introduce the idea that like maybe you know read um love and osman who who i i wrote i dedicated that poem to um she's an awesome uh somali american writer and she's a person that you can read um you can check out you know the the um the artist kelly romani who i mentioned a moment ago so sometimes just like I can't speak for everything, and there are people out there already writing those things or painting those things, and so you try to refer to that those people as well. So I don't know. That's that's uh, as much of an answer as I have, I guess. Thank you. Well, we thank you all for joining us today, and if you will join me in one more round of applause, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, guys.